Whoa, what kind of bird is that? Well, have you ever heard about Hubara? That's what we call this unique bird. Family name, Bustard. There are 26 different kinds of Bustards in the world. While most of them live in Africa, some are also found in Europe, Asia and even Australia. All of them inhabit dry, semi-desert or grassland habitats. They are all walking birds, flying only when disturbed or to change sight. The Hubara Bustard is a shy and cryptic bird, and its sandy buff-coloured plumage makes it extremely well camouflaged in steppe and desert habitats. There are two types of Hubara Bustard, the African Hubara ranging from the Canary Islands along North Africa up to Libya, and the Asian Hubara which ranges from the Middle East to Mongolia. African hubara are resident birds all over their range in North Africa, while Asian hubara includes both resident populations in Pakistan, Iran and the Middle East, and migrant populations wintering in the same areas, but breeding further north in Central Asia, China and Mongolia. Unfortunately, numbers of hubara have declined dramatically throughout their range during the 20th century. Arabs perpetuated falconry for thousands of years, without threatening the survival of Hubara populations. However, modern technology brought four-wheel drive vehicles into this age-old tradition. Human development and associated activities largely contributed to the demise of the Hubara through habitat destruction and over-exploitation. Eventually a point was reached where to avoid the extinction of the Hubara and to ensure sustainable populations that would allow the continued existence of the falconry tradition. Something had to be done. The first to react were princes from the royal family in Saudi Arabia. In 1986, the National Commission for Wildlife Conservation and Development was founded in Riyadh under the patronage of His Royal Highness Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz Al Saud and managed by His Royal Highness Prince Saud Al Faisal. During the same year, the Commission embarked on an optimistic project to breed Hubara in captivity and reintroduce them into the kingdom. The necessary facilities were built in temperate climbed taif on the Najd Plateau at the edge of the Asir Mountains. Expeditions were launched into Asia and North Africa to collect eggs from the Hubara breeding grounds. Thus, the National Wildlife Research Center was born. But producing Hubara in captivity was not an easy task. When put in contact with males, females would not mate. The hand of man was added to the equation. Female dummies were designed and used to attract the males and to collect semen. Several methods of artificial insemination were tried before finding the easiest and most efficient way. Through meticulous observation and follow-up of the birds and their behaviours, research tends to optimise conditions to obtain good captive breeding results. Diet is carefully controlled.
individuals are selected for reproduction according to their genetic value and breeding performance. Semen quality is assessed under microscope. Eggs are collected from inseminated females and artificially incubated for a period of 22 days. Egg development is regularly monitored through weight measurements and candling. Humidity in the incubators is adjusted accordingly while temperature remains constant. Fertile eggs are transferred to the hatchery room after 19 days. In 1989, the first chick in the history of Hubara captive breeding was produced in Taif. But hatching is not as successful as in the wild. Only half of the eggs produce chicks. Up to 2005, the NWRC has bred a total of 2,445 chicks. Chicks are hand-reared. As Hubara are opportunistic, omnivorous feeders, captive-bred chicks are fed with mealworms, alfalfa and pellets. Chicks are stimulated several times daily to encourage feeding. Some of them, selected to reinforce the captive breeding flock, are continuously tamed. Others continue their first months of growth in large tunnel cages, where growing vegetation and live insects are available. Human contact is reduced to a minimum. These birds are destined for the wild. In 1988, the NCWCD established the Mahazata Side Protected Area, a 2,244 square kilometer fence reserve located 200 kilometers from the NWRC on the way to Riyadh. In 1991, the first experimental releases of captive bred birds from Taif took place in the reserve. Birds have been consistently released into the protected area from 1992, when the number of captive bred chicks produced annually became large enough. Several techniques were used to release the birds, and by 2005, the total number of birds released into Mahazata side reached 573. Three years after Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates developed their own vision for Hubara conservation. 
under the initiative of the President, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan. Consequently, the National Avian Research Center was established, later becoming part of the Environmental Research and Wildlife Development Agency, based in Abu Dhabi, which was recently renamed Environment Agency in 2005. NARC works in close collaboration with falconers. Hubara are only wintering in the Emirates, so NARC initiated research on the migration of the birds by fitting some birds with satellite transmitters. The movements of more than 50 birds have been tracked this way, allowing NARC researchers to identify routes, calculate distances, time and duration of both spring and autumn migrations. Subsequently, they extended their research with expeditions into the breeding grounds of the Hubara in Asia. Every year, NARC and collaborating Asian researchers spend several months in the field, studying the mating system of the wild birds. Meanwhile, NARC also started the captive breeding of Asian Hubara. Because the climatic conditions in the Emirates are not as temperate as in Taif, NARC developed the design of indoor, environmentally controlled breeding units. After 10 years of development, the unit of optimal design is now fully operational and ready to be duplicated. Productivity of chicks could therefore reach thousands per year, compared to only a few hundreds in Taif, where seasonal weather conditions are still a determining factor. Private initiatives of princes from both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates resulted in the captive breeding of the African Hubara. Seven years after the creation of the NCWCD in Saudi Arabia, his Royal Highness Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz initiated the development of a private project in Morocco, thereby establishing a new center dedicated to the breeding of African Hubara in Agadir. This is the International Foundation for Conservation and Development of Wildlife. Two years later, King Hassan II of Morocco offered Sheikh Zayed an area in the vicinity of Misur in the Mid-Atlas in order to build his own captive breeding facility, the Emirates Center for Wildlife Propagation. Both centers benefited from the pioneering work done at the NWRC in Taif and have subsequently improved on the initial husbandry techniques. They intensified taming programs and developed techniques of artificial incubation. Both are meant to produce and release thousands of hubara for falconry purposes in an attempt to alleviate the pressure on the natural wild populations. Since they collect their breeders from the wild, the centers are also due to restock wild populations by releasing some of the captive bred birds into protected areas. CWP has become a leader in release techniques and is carefully monitoring the released birds using the non-hunting zones as study sites. While large-scale production of African hubara has proven successful in Morocco, a wild population of Asian hubara has been established in Saudi Arabia through the ongoing reintroduction project in Mahazat Asaid. All birds produced at the NWRC are fitted with radio transmitters before being released which allowed researchers to monitor their post-release movements, survival and breeding activities. The first chick from a captive bred, reintroduced female was born in 1995. Since then, birds have continued to breed naturally in the reserve. After 10 years, it is estimated that the number of hubara in the reserve exceeds 190 birds. But results differ from year to year. Hubara might not breed at all if weather conditions are not good. However, when good amounts of rain fall at the right time, and if temperatures don't increase too quickly, 
all efforts of the Hubara will be concentrated on breeding. Males choose the fixed sites where they display early morning and late afternoon, each day and all season long. Display sites are usually in slightly elevated areas devoid of vegetation. The spectacular nuptial display contrasts the normal cryptic behavior of these birds. Females, attracted from several kilometers away, choose males to mate with, lay two to four eggs in a simple scrape in the ground, incubate them for 22 days and raise their chicks. In 2001, researchers recorded as many as 120 eggs laid in 51 clutches. Some females lay replacement clutches, as eggs and chickens are often predated by foxes, birds of prey, and sometimes cats or even lizards. Despite this, few chicks survive to adulthood. Survival rate is difficult to assess, and researchers initially tried to monitor the chicks by tracking the mother. At about two months old, when the chicks are strong enough, but not proficient flyers yet, they can be caught and fitted with radio transmitters. It's uh, four eight six seven. Work by NARC has revealed crucial information about the ecology of the Asian Hubara and its global status. By tracking their migration routes, Researchers found that migrant hubara may travel 4,000 to 7,000 kilometers one way to their breeding grounds in spring or the wintering grounds in autumn. 
The migration journey lasts between three weeks and two months, depending on the entire distance they have to cover and the frequency of stopovers to replenish energy supplies. While the birds usually fly from 80 to 220 kilometers per day, one Hubara from China has reportedly flown 3,000 kilometers in four days. On the breeding grounds, studies have shown that displaying males tend to group together in the same areas, although each male strongly defends a territory, maintaining a minimum distance of 500 meters to one kilometer from one another. This so-called lacking behavior has also been observed in the Mahazata side protected area. NARC was finally able to assess the status of the Asian Hubara as a globally threatened species, estimating the probability of extinction at 70% in 30 years. For sure, the Hubara Bustard will be the origin of many other future projects. In Morocco, the ECWP has already started the construction of another large breeding unit, taking advantage of optimal climatic conditions at a site with a higher altitude. In the United Arab Emirates, the Environment Agency is also thinking about large-scale production and the number of environmentally controlled breeding units is multiplying there. In Saudi Arabia, the NCWCD has prepared a new protected area, Saja Umar Rimf, where the NWRC already reintroduced 42 birds in 2004 and 2005. Despite the promising results and all conservation measures taken by governmental agencies and other breeding and research centers, one fundamental question remains. What is the future of the Hubara Bustard? Poaching is a real problem. In Saja Umarimth, which unlike Mahazata side, is an open area, most of the birds outside of the 400 square kilometer release area are killed. At the border posts of the United Arab Emirates, the Environment Agency is regularly confiscating birds captured in Central Asia and intended for falcon training. Isn't the removal of eggs from the wild for the purpose of captive breeding a threat to natural populations, despite the restocking? Isn't the demand for large-scale production of captive-bred birds reflecting an increasing interest in falconry? And wouldn't this, in turn, increase pressure on the species? Can captive-bred birds be used for falcon training? Isn't the natural habitat available for Hubara consistently being degraded? The future of the Hubara Bustard remains uncertain. Thank you.